Transmitter device activating. Coordinate set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, your weekly explanation of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. The third consecutive issue of The Flash that we've covered. Hey. This week we are covering issue 229, published on the 25th of June, 1974, one week after Paul McCartney's 32nd birthday. And if you've been paying attention, you'll realise it was published on the same day as Adventure Comics 435. So there. Right. Pizza, you'd better tell everyone about the cover to Flash 229. I'd be delighted to. It's a, a lovely white cover, which is very unusual for this time. At the top, DC 100 pages for only 60 cents. Yes, it's a 100 pager, folks. Superb. And we're going to do every single story in this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, is it going to be our longest episode ever? Who have we got to do the guest voices? You just have to wait and see. <laughs> only joking, or am I? <laughs> Underneath that, we have the Flash logo, issue number 229, October, approved by the Comics Code Authority. Thank goodness. Mm. And we have three panels indicating some of the stories that are in this. I'll tell you about the other stories before I tell you about the story we're covering. On the right-hand side, we have Black Hand, the Green Lantern foe, who Mm. is operating some sort of equipment. And you see in front of him half of Hal Jordan, just the right side of Hal Jordan, Green Lantern. Gosh. The other half of his body has vanished. And the caption says, Who is the fantastic foe who split Green Lantern in half? Well, it's it's Black Hand, you've just told us. Spoilers. Yes, I know. It's good. (laughs) We read them so you don't have to. Yeah, it's weird, Black Hand, because he was, you know, Silver Age, Bronze Age, he he wasn't really much of a thing at all, was he? And then Blackest Night made him... Yeah, Jeff Jones completely changed him. He was all about cliches and just weird nonsense. There's a really good Flash story where he turns up with his steals Flash's aura. And hilarity ensues. Interesting. It's very good. I'm going to have to look that one up. Right, anyway. Underneath that, we have a woman in a green jumpsuit who appears to be outracing the Flash. Gasp. And the caption says, Can you believe a girl faster than the Flash? (laughs) Goodness me. Well seen. That's a story reprinted from the early 60s. Yes. You know, (laughs) incredible scenes, quite frankly. Yes. (laughs) And we've decided we're probably going to do that story as a flashback at some point, listeners. Yes. Given the nature of it, so watch out for that. Uh, At the bottom, there's some headlines telling us about the other stories in it. Extra, Kid Flash learns the secret of the handicapped boys. Special, the Golden Age Flash finds the secret city. Also, Johnny Quick has ten jobs as the man with ten hats. Oh, Johnny Q, God bless him. Plus exclusive Flash features. My goodness, but forget everything I've just said, because the story we're covering is the main panel on the cover, and we have the Ragdoll, the Earth 2 Jay Garrick villain, the Ragdoll. He's running away with a bag of loot being pursued by Jay Garrick Flash. However, Barry Allen seems to have his leg out, tripping Jay up. Jay's hat's going flying. It's shocking. Good grief. Barry's saying, you've had it, chum. Let a younger Flash take over. And the caption says... The astonishing ragdoll runs wild. Jay doesn't seem to have his grey hair in this one. I know this is a minor, and it's a quite a small illustration, and it's a very minor pick for me, but, you know, Barry doesn't look that much younger. It's quite a goofy, cartoony-looking Jay. It's an interesting story. This is my almost pristine copy of Flash 229. I bought it summer of 1993 from the late, great Mr Peter Root. I sent it to Pete the other day in our prep chat. I haven't read this since I bought it. <gasps> Gasp. Yeah, Pete, there's something Peter said about, are you going to do the, this voice for this character? And I went... Huh? I'd forgotten this character was in it. So we're about to obviously reveal who that character is as we jump into the story. A new whirlwind adventure starring The Flash and The Golden Age Flash. And we're given the credits for this week's adventure. Story Carrie Bates, Art Irv Novik and Frank McLaughlin. Yep, spoilers, but the main part of the image shows Ragdoll, who we all remember from being used so well in the James Robinson, Tony Harris Starman series, legging it from both Flashes. But looming over them all, grasping his helmet firmly, is none other than the Thinker, <gasps> who we haven't seen for a very long time. True. Was the last time we saw the Thinker when the two atoms teamed up ages ago? I believe so, yes. Uh-huh. Wow! Years. Mm. Listeners, we'll probably post a, a link to that in the socials at some point this week. Watch out for that. Anyway, as they pursue the Ragdoll, Barry Flash is saying, We've caught up to Ragdoll. Let's take him. It'll be a snap, says Jay. That crook isn't a match for one Flash, let alone two... And we get some more captioning which reads, 
A pair of flashies running up against a defenseless foe who doesn't even carry a weapon? An incredible scene, but not as incredible as it appears, for there is another villain who will shortly turn the odds against the Scarlet Speedsters in... The Ragdoll Runs Wild! Tremendo so! Story properly begins, top of page two, we get an establishing caption. It started like all other mornings, with police scientist Barry Allen kissing his wife Iris as he left for work. Oh, love's young dream. Big kiss from Iris and she says, Coming home for lunch today, darling? Can't, sweetheart. I've got a date with another woman. Huh. That'll be the day. With your habit of being late all the time, she'll be long gone by the time you show up. Barry thinks... That's what you think, Iris. As Barry takes his leave, Barry looking very smart in a black and white striped shirt and a red tie. Woo! It's about yes. 19, mm. 1982, if you ask me. Anyway, <laughs> caption for panel three. Hours later, as a friend peeks into Barry's lab at Central City Police Headquarters... Yes, look at the gleaming floors. It's completely unlike my kitchen. Yes, a <laughs> spectacled chap was opening the door, leaning in. There's no sign of Barry. He's, he's saying... Barry, how about some... Lo-? And he thinks... Gone. Looks like he already went home to that good-looking dish of his. Yes, obviously talking about the casserole dish that Barry and I always got as a wedding present. The caption for panel four reads, But looks can be deceiving. Yes, because we see Barry vibrating, obviously, at super speed so that Matt doesn't see him. Barry is unleashing his costume by pressing the button on his ring and he's thinking, Matt almost caught me in the act of pressing my costume ring. Vibrated into invisibility just in time. Awesome. Caption for panel five. After slipping into the celebrated costume that expands instantly on contact with the air... (laughs) That's a great caption. That reminds me of that thing you always say about Mercury from the Metal Men. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Doc, never tell you I'm the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. (laughs) Yes, we we all know what Barry's costume does, but, you know, truthfully, this might be someone's first Flash comic, so they need to know. Indeed. Yes, Barry is pulling on a uniform and rushing off, and he's thinking... Now for Flash's secret rendezvous with that other woman... And the caption for the final panel of page two. Across Central City spurts the fastest man on earth. Yeah, we've got aerial shots and nice glass-covered skyscrapers, all very modern. We can see the red blur of the flash as he speeds along the road. And whilst he's running along, he is thinking. It's been a long time since Joan and I have seen each other, but not long enough for me to forget how to read her. Her voice sounded anxious over the trans-earth signaller. Gosh. First panel of page three, we see Barry running to a familiar building. He's approaching the Central City Community Centre, which you may remember from all the way back in flash number 123. As he approaches the community centre, Barry is still thinking to himself. Just as well, the old community centre was closed down years ago. Makes it easier to vibrate into Earth 2 from its stage without being seen. Awesome. For those of you not in the know, Earth 2 is a parallel world that occupies the same space as our Earth, but coexists on a different vibratory plane. And just as Barry Allen is the Flash of Earth 1, so Jay Garrick is the Flash of Earth 2. Tremendous. It's a great image here showing sort of translucent images of Barry and Jay's heads overlapped with their, their respective Earths. Pretty cool. Not had that in a while, really. I mean, at this, at this late stage, you know, in 1974, mm-hmm. I would have thought we would have seen it a lot more than we have by now. Yeah, true. I think it becomes a bit more of a conceit the further we go on. Anyway, yeah. lots more captioning to go. You'd be glad to hear, listeners. But no sooner has the Scarlet Speedster vibrated through the wall and into the abandoned auditorium. The abandoned auditorium? That sounds like the name of an Alfred Hitchcock and a Three Investigators novel, doesn't it? I think the menswear played one of their first gigs in an abandoned auditorium. <laughs> they probably did. <laughs> yeah. Barry, as arriving on the stage, is greeted by the sight of three goons, one in an orange jumper, one in a brown jacket, one in a purple jacket. The one in the purple jacket's kind of baldy, the brown jumper guy's got dark hair, kind of sandy red-haired chap in the orange jumper, coordinating his hair with the jumper. Impressive. There's a big leather bag on the floor, and they're either counting big wads of notes into it or out of it. The guy in the orange jumper whirls when he spots Barry and says, The Flash! The guy in the brown jacket says, He's on to us. And the guy, the poor baldy guy in the purple jacket says, How do you know we were here? Orange guy, we can see he's got a gun in the next panel, brings it into view and says, Stop blabbing and start blasting. If we're lucky, we'll cut him down before he whips super speed on us. And the others also reach for their pistols. But, unluckily, before a single shot can be fired... Yes, we're suddenly in a different location. We can see a manhole, take a drink if you feel like it. The three goons are sat in the middle of the road with a police car approaching. Purple Jacket says, Huh? How do we end up in the middle of this street? Orange Jumper Guy says, Where's the community centre? And the guy in the brown jacket says, What happened to the Flash? The police car draws level and the two cops get out. 
Then there's pistols and indicating them towards the three goons, and the first cop says, Look at this, Mike. The Walton gang waiting to be picked up, along with their loot. <laughs> They'll never believe this at headquarters. In the first panel of page four, we see the Walton gang being ushered towards the police car by Mike and his colleague as all the captioning continues. No, reader, you didn't miss anything. Everything happened as suddenly as you saw it. But if you want to know what you and the Walton gang couldn't possibly have seen... Let's backtrack a few seconds to the community centre, where... Yes, the next few panels are all rounded at the edge because we're in flashback territory. The Flash is rushing into the abandoned auditorium at the community centre. He sees the goons and he thinks... Looks like I've run into a gang hideout. As the orange jumper guy cries, The Flash! Barry thinks in the next panel... First I grab up their loot. And we see him doing so at super speed. We hear orange jumper guy saying, as he did before, Stop blabbing and start blasting! Cut him down before he whips super speed on us. And as they start to fire, we see the Flash running around and past them, thinking, That crooked bunch doesn't know it yet, but they're about to be disarmed. And evicted. And the final panel of page four shows some nice super speed action as the three goons are whipped out of the way, leaving their pistols literally hanging in midair. We arrive at the top of page five. So powerful was the fastest man alive speed stream, all three thugs were swept off their feet and whisked along for a blurring ride. Yep, and it looks like the three guys are busting a move, frankly, as they're drawn along in the, the Flash's slipstream, and Barry thinks, Now that I've picked up this excess baggage, where do I unload it? And a caption tells us, of course, A problem promptly solved by an approaching patrol car. Yep, because Barry has spotted Mike and his mate approaching, indeed, and Flash thinks, That's a load off my mind. There'll be easy pickings for the police. And Barry starts to slow, and the three goons and their loot are dumped in the middle of the road. We return to the main narrative halfway down page five and another caption. And that's an instant replay of what happened to the Waltons in a split second. As for the fastest man alive, he's back on stage at the community centre, where... The Waltons, of course, was that long-running <laughs> programme starring Richard Thomas. Yes, I wonder if any of these bad guys is called John Boy. <laughs> yes! We got it at BBC Two over here, mainly in a bit of repeating Channel 4 in the, the 80s and 90s. And, yeah, we'll look forward to Peter and I's Walton's Rewatch podcast coming soon. Yes. I bet you they say goodnight to each other for quite some time in jail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Right, we're going long. Let's go on with it. Yes. <laughs> Barry starts to, well, he starts to speed up. It looks like he's whirling around at a spot and he's thinking... Vibrating at this certain spot enables me to break through the barrier between Earths. Yes, that reminds me of what um, Mercury from the Metal Men always used to say. <laughs> um, and then in the next panel, near the bottom of page five, we see the Flash slowing his vibrations down as he appears on a, a normal city street. Barry is thinking, Out of my spin and into Jay Garrick's hometown, Keystone City. And guess what, listeners, there's another caption. Scarcely an eye blink later at 5252 78th Street. Yes, we see Joan Garrick opening the door to Barry Flash and she's saying, Barry? Hello, Joan. How are you? Oh, not too good. And I'm afraid Jay is worse. Top of page six. Another caption. As Mrs. Flash of Earth 2 confides her troubles to Barry Flash. Yes, a nice aerial external shot of Jane Joan's house. We can hear Joan from inside. It's nothing I can put my finger on, but I know something's wrong. Jay's been acting different. Strange the past few days. Just little things, but... But the sort of things only a wife can see. Exactly, Barry. It's... As the saying goes, a gut feeling I have. Barry's sat there very politely with a cup of tea and he stands in the next panel pulling his mask on, saying, Tell you what, Joan, point me in Jay's direction. I'll sort of bump into him and find an excuse to hang around a while. Barry, I feel better already. Soon? Yes, we see the crimson comma accelerating along, thinking, Joan said Jay would probably be patrolling this part of town today, on the lookout for a mysterious criminal called Ragdoll. Abruptly, a scarlet haze comes into focus alongside the super speedster. Yep, Jay Garrick has arrived on the scene, and he says, Barry, thought that was your blur I spotted. What on earth, too, are you doing in Keystone City? Would you believe I happen to be passing through? Well, whatever the reason, I'm sure glad you're here. Now I've got someone to confide in. Problems, Jay? A triple-jointed problem called Ragdoll. He's an old foe of mine who's on a new crime kick, stealing valuable antique dolls. And a little asterisk part of the way through that there leads us to another caption which tells us... Ragdoll first appeared in Flash Comics 36, December 1942. Editor. Awesome. 
Next panel is a nice aerial shot of the two flashes running through Keystone. And we can see a shop there that sells cigars. But significantly, there doesn't seem to be much happening in the window. Maybe they've gone out of business because smoking's bad. Anyway, flashes are running along and Jay's saying, This week we've tangled three times in a row, but each time Ragdoll got cleaned away and left me with egg on my face. How's he do it, Jay? A clever escape gimmick? A tricky getaway device? A secret weapon? No, nothing like that. Ragdoll uses no gimmicks at all. He's just an ordinary contortionist who turned into a common crook. Yet somehow he always manages to slip through my fingers. The next couple of pages have all got rounded panels because we're in flashback mode as Jay Garrick narrates. The first time I spotted Ragdoll dashing out of an antique shop. And we see a, a rather portly gentleman in a black waistcoat standing outside his antique business pointing at Ragdoll who's legging it with obviously something valuable. And the shop owner is saying, Stop him someone! That ancient Egyptian doll he stole is worth a fortune! And helpfully, Jay Garrick Flash just happens to be standing in a pavement outside. He sees this and thinks, Ragdoll back in action, after all these years? Jay's narration for the next panel. Though past experience taught me the contorting crook was clever, I didn't anticipate much trouble in handling him. And we see that the Ragdoll, who's a horrible nightmare face, he really does, is holding this Egyptian doll, and Jay Flash is running towards him, saying, Give up, Ragdoll, or I'll tie that triple jointed body of yours into a square knot. Jay's narration continues, But Smiley just stood there, Barry. Looking smugly confident, so, Jay starts to circle the ragdoll, running at speed, thinking, This momentary vacuum I'm whirlwinding will make him keel over. We arrive at the top of page 8, Jay's narration. But then, although I'm usually on the lookout for this hazard, my boots skimmed over an oil slick in the street. And that's what we see happening. Jay's pixie boots slipping on some oil, his narration for the next panel. As one flash to another, you know what happened. At super speed velocity, one slip like that can have disastrous effects. And we see the ragdoll laughing <laughs> as Jay comes out of the whirlwind circle and goes flying over the road and crashes on the pavement next to a rubbish bin. Take a drink. Actually, there's a bottle coming out of the rubbish bin, so yes, it provides a drink for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. Very handy. Jay's narration continues. It took a brick wall to slow me down and a long hour to open my eyes again. Yes, we see Jay lying seemingly unconscious against the brick wall. The dustbin beside him tipped over, and as Peter said, there's a bottle lying next to it. Yeah, to all intents and purposes, if you were a passerby, you'd look at this and you'd think that Jay has just drunk himself into oblivion. It was just lying in the pavement. Terrible. We see his helmet lying beside him. We should point that out. The next panel, we're back with Barry and Jay speeding along the pavement together in the present, and Barry Flash is saying, But Jay, falls like that are occupational hazards to us, super speedsters. Ragdoll was lucky, that's all. Yeah, that's exactly what I told myself. Until the next day. And we're back in flashback territory, Jay's narration, when, uncannily, I came across him again, scooting off from another doll theft at a private collector's estate. And we can see that they're obviously in the grounds of some big house, Ragdoll is running along the grass, got a doll in his hand, and we can see what looks like the garden sprinkler going behind them. Flash is caught up with them, saying, Hold it, Ragdoll, this time I'm taking you. In the final panel of page 8, we see Jay running past the garden sprinkler, thinking, there are no oil slicks to trip me up this time. Jay's narration at the top of page 9, though. But I found another way to trip myself up. I carelessly overlooked the effect my super speed would have on water sprinklers. My speed backwash created a powerful water jet that was pulled along behind me. So when I slowed down to grab Ragdoll, and we see Jay just about to catch Ragdoll, got you! The water spray catches up with him and strikes him in the back, knocking his helmet off with a quack, <laughs> allowing Ragdoll to escape. Jay's narration continues in the next panel. Two chances at the creep and I botched them both. Yet incredible as it sounds, yesterday, opportunity struck again. And we see Jay, obviously on patrol, standing on a pavement, looking up, coincidentally, and he sees Ragdoll leaping from the roof of one building to the roof of another. And Jay thinks, Ragdoll, making a rooftop getaway. Is he toying with me, daring me to capture him? Jay's narration for the final panel of page nine. Up the side of the building I ran, defying gravity with sheer velocity. I was cautious yet confident. I would keep a wary eye out for any freaky accidents. But how wrong I was. Listen, several floors above, and we see a little boy who's obviously playing near the window. Dangerous, don't do it, kids. And he drops his toy, crying, Ah, I lost my ball! At my speed, I knew a rubber ball dropping towards me could be deadlier than a cannonball. Cannonball, of course, being everyone's favourite member of the New Mutants. Normally, I would have dodged it without even slowing up, but this time, I panic-reacted. And Jay tells us what he's doing, as he thinks, I'll duck into this open window. 
but he appears in obviously the bedroom of an older matronly lady who sat in bed with her hair in curls eating a box of chocolates. Flash is on his knees on her bedroom floor in front of her and she cries, eh, a peeping Flash! <laughs> peeping Flash, of course, supported the Montrose Avenue, blah, blah, blah. In the next panel, we're back in the present day. Barry and Jay sat on a park bench. There's a nice rubbish bin beside them. Take a drink. And Jay, with his helmet in his hand, is saying, Needless to say, by the time I apologised and reached the roof, and Barry finishes for him saying, Ragdoll had given you the slip again. That cinched it, Barry. You know the old saying, three strikes and out. It was bound to happen sooner or later. The years have finally caught up with me. I'm a has-been. Jay, you can't believe that any more than I do. You mustn't. Sure, you're a few microseconds slower than you once were, and your reflexes aren't quite as ultra-quick, but what you've lost in speed, you've more than gained in experience. It's a very interesting panel here, because... Our perspective shifts to quite some distance behind the park bench that Flash is sitting on. We see a squirrel in very close proximity to the artist's eye, eating a nut. Now, is this squirrel going to come back? Is this a significant squirrel? We'll just have to wait and see. Is this the first appearance of the supervillain, the squirrel? Are we going to have to do a Portman 2 episode on characters that have the word <laughs> squirrel in their name? Oh, we'll have to do it next. <laughs> we'll have to check and then cram it in next week. Anyway, we cut back to the two Flashes. Barry is saying... I think there's another explanation for Ragdoll's escapes. But then Barry seems to pull himself up, saying, Hold it! No time for thinking now. We gotta act. Huh? Says Jay. And then Barry points, saying, There goes your old foe, and my new one, Ragdoll. Yes, and coincidentally, Ragdoll just seems to be running through the park where the flashes are. He's got something else in his hand, and Jay stands, saying, Forget what I just said, Barry. Let's go flashing! Now... Does flashing mean something different in Keystone City to what it does over here? <laughs> flashing in the park, yes. Yes. That's what you should be doing, folks. <sighs> Honestly, we're getting it right. We're definitely getting a tweet out of that one. <laughs> in our latest episode, listeners, Barry and Jay go flashing in the park. Yes. Ragdoll, close to the camera in the next panel, looking back at Flash, he's grinning to himself as the two flashes accelerate after him. I think we're pretty much where we are in the opening splash panel now. Mm. Jay is saying... We'll show that mop of hair how fast two flashes can put him in the slammer. Now you're talking, pal. That sounds like the old Jay I know. But then, in the next panel, Jay notices a small animal in the grass in front of him and thinks, Hey, a squirrel smacking my path. Only a millisecond to sidestep it. Which he manages, but then Barry notices... Uh Uh-oh. Flash blew it again, just like the other three times. Maybe... Maybe the guy is over the hill. Yes, we see Jay skidding to obviously probably land on his backside. Very good of Jay, though, to avoid wiping out that squirrel at high speed. Yes, check off squirrel. Yes, check off squirrel. They obviously also supported the Montrose Avenue, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) In the first panel of page 12, Barry Flash is chasing after Ragdoll and he's thinking. That leaves it up to me to bag this doll thief. With a face like his, he doesn't look very dangerous. In the next panel, Barry starts to pull the same trick on Ragdoll that Jay did already. He circles Ragdoll, starts whirling at super speed, thinking, But since Jay has had so much trouble trying to nab Ragdoll, I'm not taking any chances. His arm extended into the ground, the flash races around Ragdoll like a whirling scoop, spraying him with dirt from head to toe, until... And we are privy to the thoughts of Ragdoll as his head is all that can be seen poking out this mound of dirt, and he's thinking, Can't move. Blast it. Flash has trapped me in a mound of earth. Mound of Earth, etc, etc, Britpop band the 90s. Caption for the next panel. But when the monarch of motion takes a closer look at the dazed, dirt-clogged criminal... Ragdoll doesn't look very happy. There's a bit of a sort of burst of energy around the top of his head at this point. Barry has noticed this, thinking... Strange. My speed-geared vision shows a vibratory aura around Ragdoll's head. Interesting. And even more puzzling when his fellow Flash approaches... Yep, Jay walks over, saying... Looks like I flubbed it again. Some help I was, huh? Barry says... Forget it. But then he notices... Good gosh, I see an aura around Jay's head too. Yes, he's thinking this, and very thoughtfully indeed he strokes his chin at the final panel of page 12, thinking... Neither of them seems aware of the auras they've got in common, yet there must be some connection. Hmm. I wonder... You can make a meme out of this image of Barry looking thoughtful. Hmm, thinks... Anyway, we arrive at the top of page 13. Soon at Keystone City Police Headquarters, where an unmasked ragdoll is being questioned. Yes, there's a police sergeant there. Ragdoll's got his mask off. His mask is sat on the table beside him. And Ragdoll, without the mask, a very thin-looking elderly gentleman. White hair, sort of slipped back. One little curl hanging forward. The police sergeant is saying, Come on, Rags. How can you sit there and tell us you don't remember committing those doll thefts? 
To which Ragdoll says, Cause it's the truth. Give me a lie detector test and you'll see for yourselves. After some discussion, a polygraph expert is brought in. Hooray! Yes, the polygraph expert is a older looking gentleman, slick back, dark hair, wearing a lab coat as a black tie. The polygraph is just like a big box with some dials and switches and a line in the front with some cords that come out the side that are attached to Ragdoll's wrist. Ragdoll is saying, One thing before we begin. C- can I have my mask back? I I get too edgy without it. The polygraph expert replies, Better give it to him. Undue nervousness could upset the readings. And Ragdoll puts his mask back on in panel three, looking scary as heck, as he says, Ah, that's better. I feel more like myself now. Ask away, Doc. As the usual, preliminary questions begin. Yeah, the next three panels, we show the little line of interference, I suppose, for want of a better way, the display screen on the device, which obviously the line's jaggling in response to the question. So the, the dialogue goes like this. By what name are you known? Ragdoll. It's not too much interference, so the expert identifies that as true. Now, tell me your real name. Yule Gibbons. And there's a massive disruption to the line. It's not an even line at all. Lots of ups and downs and peaks and troughs. And the scientist says, false. Again, what is your real name? Pete Merkel. Yes, and the line is level again. And the scientist says, true. That's better. Now we'll proceed. Did you commit the doll thefts? I repeat. Did you commit the doll thefts? Unresponsive Ragdoll just sort of sat there with the flash he's watching. Barry starts to look very concerned. In the first panel of page 14, we see the readout again, which is a very, very level straight line. The scientist says, Good Lord, this is impossible. A reading like this could only mean this man is dead. In panel 2 of page 14, the scientist is attempting to take Ragdoll's pulse, holding his wrist between his fingers, and the scientist says, Something's wrong here. I can't find a pulse anywhere. Barry says, Better get his mask off. And Jay reaches forward in the next panel, pulling off the, the ragdoll mask, saying, For Pete's sake, Merkel's become a ragdoll, for real. There's nothing but cloth stuffing under here. And we see that as Jay pulls off the mask, the elderly gentleman's vanished, leaving a blue sewn fabric dummy. The scientist looks appalled and says, but, but how could such a thing happen? He was a living, breathing person just a moment ago. Soon after no explanation can be found for the bizarre transformation... Yes, the police sergeant who we met earlier is back in the room, and he and the two flashes are looking at the, the dummy that was ragged all stretched out in front of them, and the police sergeant is saying, I suppose our police lab's as good a place as any to leave that thing for now. Jay scratches the back of his head, saying, What a puzzler! Could Ragdoll have cleverly masterminded and escaped and left this life-sized doll in his place? Which Barry says, Not likely. He was never out of our sight, nor speed-geared eyes would have spotted even the swiftest switch. You're right. Then that must be the real ragdoll, his flesh and blood somehow transformed into cloth and stuffing. What a grisly end. In the final panel of page 14, two flashes are leaving police headquarters, rushing off, and Jay's saying, After that experience, we could use a change of pace. How about joining Joan and me for dinner, Barry? Uh, thanks for the invitation, but I'm already late for dinner on my earth. We arrive at the top of page 15. Scant seconds later, a scarlet speedster spins away from Earth 2. Yeah, no need for Barry to return to the community centre or anything at this point. They're just in the middle of a field. We can see Keystone in the background behind them. Barry is starting to circle and twist and vibrate, and Jay is waving him off, saying, Say hello to Iris for me, if she's still speaking to you tonight. I know how your lateness grades her. Be sure to let me know if you ever get the ragdoll mystery solved. A slow dissolve, caption for panel two. Later at the Garrick home. Yep, we're back with Joan and Jay. Joan is saying, What is it, dear? Can't you tell me what's troubling you? And Jay, looking thoughtful, stroking his chin, replies, a funny feeling. The kind you get when you know you've been had, but you don't know how. It happened at police headquarters today. Elsewhere. At that moment, in the darkened police lab. Yes, we see the cloth head of the ragdoll dummy, and a hand reaching for it. And the voice belonging to the hand is saying, Nothing but cloth for a face. It's true, then. My whole operation is ruined. Suddenly, a light switch is flipped. Yep. The light comes on, and we see a gentleman in a brown suit with a very smart black and white striped shirt, a black tie, and a weird helmet with lots of electrical wire and dials and stuff attached to it. He has a neat moustache. We have met him before. It's the thinker. The thinker whirls around and says, Who turned on the light? You! And we see that Barry Flash is indeed the chap who flipped the light switch. Barry replies, So, the thinker, you're the criminal mastermind I've been waiting for. But... 
You vibrated back to your earth. I, I saw you leave. Yes, but you didn't see me come back, so I could hide here tonight to see if my hunch was right. Blast! I fell for a setup. My fellow Flesh's wife told me he was acting strange, and the running defeats against Ragdoll proved something was handicapping him. Four escapes in a row were just too much for coincidence. The next panel, as the rounded edges of flashback, as we see an image of Ragdoll's head poking out of the, the pile of dirt, and Jay standing looking at him, and Barry's narration for this says... And after I spotted identical vibratory auras around the heads of Flash and Ragdoll, I knew they were being manipulated by someone else. A very ingenious scheme you'd worked out for yourself, Thinker. You commanded Ragdoll to steal valuable dolls that fits his M.O., and commanded Flash to be nearby every crime so he'd try to nab him, but make a convenient mistake each time so that Ragdoll could escape. That way it looked like Flash was losing his touch, and no one would suspect another thief behind Ragdoll's crimes. So... Once you figured out my game, you played one of your own to lure me here. You guessed it, and because the other Flash was under your control, I couldn't let him in in my plan, or let him know what really happened during the lie detector test today. Yes, we got another round-edged panel, which Barry narrates, to round out page 16. I saw my chance when Flash and the polygraph expert took their eyes off Ragdoll to look at the readings. Yes, we see Jay and the scientist looking at the clipboard and stuff. The scientist is saying... I repeat, did you commit the doll thefts? And Barry looks on at this and thinks, I figure they'll be watching the needle for at least seven-tenths of a second. Seven-tenths is all I need. The next few panels are narrated by Barry as he describes what he's up to. Three-tenths. Super speeding out of the building, I raced to a nearby department store and borrowed a life-size stuffed rag figure from the window dressing section. <laughs> Helpful. Yes, we see Barry zooming back out of a shop, which looks like it might be called Stacy. I wonder if that's an in-gag. He continues. Four-tenths. Next step was to remove Merkel's clothes, where he sat, just as he was about to answer the key question. Yes, and we see Barry disrobing the skinny ragdoll old man as Jay and the scientist look at the reading on the polygraph machine, which seems to have grown in size from when we first saw it. <laughs> Six-tenths. Then I snatched up Merkel himself and whisked him out of the lab across town to a cell in another precinct station. Yes, we see Barry Flash arriving at the 47th police precinct with Merkel in his arms. With one-tenth second to go, I had just enough time to dress the stuffed figure in Ragtow's costume and wire him to the machine in Merkel's place. Which is what we see Barry doing. I'm not convinced of you listeners. The scientist can be heard saying, Good Lord, this is impossible. A reading like that can only mean this man is dead. Barry's narration... After that, it was just a matter of pretending to be as shocked as my colleagues. And then the flashback, we hear Barry saying, Better get his mask off. As the scientist says, Something's wrong here. I can't find a pulse anywhere. And we return to the present in the first panel of page 18, as they stand in this laboratory, and the thinker is saying to the Flash, My compliments, Flash, on a truly inspired trick to bring me out into the open. But you're guilty of one mistake your more experienced fellow Flash never would have made. You should have waited to explain your trick after you captured me. And with that, the thinker reaches up, activates something in his helmet, which makes some of the jars, test tubes and vials of chemicals in this police laboratory jump up into the air and empty their contents in the direction of the Flash, who starts coughing, saying, <coughs> That thinking cap of his, dousing me with poisonous gas! <coughs> the thinker grasps his helmet in the next panel, thinking, Flash is counting on his speed spin to blow away the fumes so he can capture me. But that's his second mistake. We see Barry start to vibrate, indeed, as the thinker says that. And then panel four, Barry is then struck with a few bolts of electricity from the overhead ceiling lamp. Good grief, that's what the thinker was doing when he was activating his helmet again. And Flash is thinking, Ah, uh, he, he siphoned an electric charge out of that light fixture. Which means that Barry's down on his knees in the next panel. Thinker standing over him says, You're through, Flash. The shock left you two days to muster any super speed. Nothing to stop me from finishing you off. But off camera, a voice yells, Except me! And in the next panel, Jay speeds into view as the thinker says, What? The other flash? And Jay says, I'm pinch hitting for my fellow speedster, finishing what he started. At the top of page 19, the thinker grabs his helmet again, saying, Ha! You're an even bigger fool than he is. Don't you know that you've been under my mental control for days now? All I have to do is think a command and you're forced to obey it. But then he pauses in the next panel. Uh, so something's wrong. I'm thought commanding you to drop dead, but nothing's happening. Jay replies, Obviously. Tell me, when's the last time your thinking cap had a tune-up? What do you mean? And then he realises, oh, This isn't my cap, it's yours. You switch them at invisible super speed. And we see indeed the thinker is holding Jay's flash helmet. And Jay's holding the thinker's helmet. 
She replies, You're so right, thinker, and without your cap you're just an other ordinary crook who's going to do all his thinking the next few years behind bars. And with that, G rushes forward, grabs his helmet, which the thinker has discarded as he tries to leg it, and G runs around in front of the thinker and punches him out. Ugh! exclaims the thinker as the Barry Flash says, Atta boy, pal! And in the caption for the next panel reads, And after Barry reveals how the diabolic thinker had manipulated Ragdoll and Jay like human puppets... Yeah, Jay's standing holding the thinker's helmet saying, Phew, what an ingenious plan! But yours topped him, Barry. I came back here tonight because I couldn't shake the feeling the Ragdoll switch was a trick. But I never dreamed it was your trick. They shake hands in the next panel as Barry Flash says, Good thing you showed up or I might not be alive to shake your hand. We're even, Barry. Thanks to you, I found out I haven't lost my super speed skills after all. Later, back on Earth 1, as Barry relates his adventure to Iris. So that other woman was John Garrick. But tell me, what would have happened if Jay hadn't saved you from the thinker? Just between us, Mrs. Allen, both Jay and the thinker forgot my rubber soled boots are insulated. And I was pretending to be dazed to catch the thinker off guard. Barry and Iris embrace. In the final panel of the story, as Iris replies, But when Jay showed up, you deliberately let him save you to regain his confidence. That's what I call a real superhero. Big hogs and a small caption reads, End. It was a thinker all along, even though they told us that in the splash page. Yes, it was a thinker all along. <laughs> yeah, no, that kind of gave it away. I mean, that was uh-huh. really careless. If they hadn't done that, you know... It would have been a nice surprise reveal. If yeah. it had just been the shot of the two flashes chasing Ragdoll like on the cover, that would have been absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the image in the cover isn't strictly accurate, like a lot of the covers we've had recently. Barry does not yeah. trip Jay up at any point. Actually, he's nope. doing everything he can to help Jay, because he's a good pal. The mm-hmm. thing that struck me is just at the start, still making the comparison between the two Earths and still sort of suggesting that Earth 1 is our Earth. Yeah, yeah. Even just, you know, one issue after the, the adventure from 228. Uh-huh. Probably means it more in, in the way of our Earth, meaning the Earth that you're used to reading about. Yeah, I know, I know, but I'm just being pedantic. I'm being pedantic about sort of Oh, stuff. I know, I know, I know, yes. That's what we're here for. <laughs> exactly. It's, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to note when that, if, if when that sort of phrasing ever changes. Hmm. This really felt like a bit of a proper Silver Age throwback, didn't it? Yes, very much so. It was tons of fun. I've always loved Ragdoll. My first introduction to him was in the JLA, JSA crossover in JLA 195 to 197. Of course. I can't wait to get to those stories. <laughs> They're fantastic. Yes. Yeah, it's Secret Society supervillains. He's recruited for them and he... I was going to say he's never been creepier, but then, of course, breaches uh, period in Starman, which is very different. Yes. And, of course, he's got a descendant as well in the Ragdoll in 66. Of course. Who is even creepier. Yes. I haven't read any of that Secret Six stuff. Oh. Ross has, I know, Ross has recommended it to me strongly many times in the past. Mm. I'll get to it. I mean, I'm actually doing quite well this year at catching up and reading a lot of comics I've been meaning to for a while, so maybe I'll get to it before good. too long. Good, good. Yeah, it, it genuinely felt like a bit of a throwback with a couple of, you know... Earth 2 rogues sort of not quite teaming yeah. up but mm-hmm. appearing in the same story. The thinker's back to his business suit with his colander helmet on as opposed to his more battle suits type that he had uh, in the Atom story. Yes, that's, that's right. That's disappointing yeah. really. I really like that suit. Yeah, you should um you should get one that looks like it and I think you could pull that off quite easily. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and you should get a colander and put it in your head with some wire sticking out of it and you could pull that off well, easily. Well, it's funny you should see that. <laughs> Listeners, do you have a colander lying in your kitchen? Please take a photograph of yourself wearing it, pretending to be either the Flash or the Thinker, and send it to the Earth 2 podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Mr. Shufo, we're looking at you. The word I've got for this really is just traditional. I don't really have too much else to say. Yes. It was completely, I mean this in the nicest possible way, completely unremarkable. I enjoyed the little J flashback. Mm-hmm. The one flashback I thought was baffling was the whole sequence over page three and four. Yeah. When Barry catches the Waltons... <laughs> The Waltons. <laughs> when Barry catches the Waltons and dumps them with the police, and then we get a page and a half of a flashback showing how he did it, why not just show it within it? That seemed a bit... <laughs> they could have just shown him going into vibratory speed uh-huh. and doing all of that, rather than... You know, I think most readers would have guessed what, what the Flash had done, but it just, to me, it seemed yeah. structurally really weird mm-hmm. to just waste a page immediately. <laughs> but I suppose it was maybe flagging up that Barry was going to pull a super speed trick that we wouldn't see what was going on. Yeah. Maybe that's what Carrie was doing. He was sort of going, right, you know, mm-hmm. Barry Flash is capable of moving at stupid speed and doing interesting things. Yes. It's possible. And there's a wee continuity error in that scene as well, because the caption, when they're dropped off in front of the police car, says, 
But unluckily, before a single shot can be fired, ah, but in the flashback we see that there's one, two, three shots being fired. Yeah. Yeah, have actually fired at the flash, but he's run past them already at that point. So, yes. Oh, carry. Yeah, pretty sloppy that bit, <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, obviously, the, like we talked about, the squirrel being set up and it turned out to be a bit of a Chekhov squirrel. Chekhov, Chekhov squirrel, squirrel, blah, blah, blah. Britpop mm. band, the 90s menswear, etc. Number 40 with mm. a bullet. That was all quite interesting. So there was there was a little bit of bait and switch at various points, which I thought was funny. I I find it difficult to believe that Jay would not have perceived what Barry was up to. Yeah, yeah, because they did comment saying our speed geared vision would notice, and of course, in this peripheral view, I'm surely Jay would see it. But then again, he might be really focusing on the yeah on the lie detector test. So yeah, mm. yeah, it's it's interesting to think what would have happened if Ragdoll somehow had been turned into cloth and stuffing, or been revealed to be cloth and stuffing all along. Yeah. We mentioned Starman briefly. They did some really uh-huh. interesting stuff in that where it was, I wish I could remember. They sort of alluded that his powers were sort of a little bit more unnatural than right. previously thought because I think he'd, he's supposed to have been killed off and then reincar- reincarnated at some point mm. in the storyline, isn't he? Spoilers for anyone who's listening to Opal City Confidential. I can't remember offhand. It's been a long time since I've read it and I do need to jump back in. Ross will get to it in a few months, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I did like how this kind of referenced the, the heroic trope in these stories of the hero meets the villain three times and is defeated twice by the villain and the third time he catches him because that's the thing that Carrie actually referenced in the story in which he appeared in the very last issue of The Flash mm-hmm. but in this case Jay has three encounters with the ragdoll and the third one he's defeated and he thinks nope three strikes and I'm out that's me I'm washed up so that was a nice reference to that uh-huh. the whole idea of like usually you get them on the third go yeah I quite enjoyed that, yeah. Yeah. Ah, it shows that, I mean, Carrie's putting a lot of thought into this. I mean, it will be interesting to see what the, the contemporary correspondence sort of says because I, I really don't have much to add. It's like obviously, J. Barry team-ups aren't as regular as used to be. Last time we saw yeah. Jay and Barry together, I think it was issue 215, which isn't that long ago as the crow flies, but it's, it's been a little while since we saw them together in the recent Just League, Just the Society team-up. Obviously, of course, it was just Jay that was in it, no Barry. Mm-hmm. It was nice for what it was. It's always good to see the two of them together. And I like to throw back to Barry going to the community centre to, to shift over. Yes. That was fun. Definitely. I must admit, I loved the artwork in this, especially the creepy ragdoll faces. They were fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Strongly agreed. I mean, it's in the best possible way. There's a nice straightforwardness to Irv Novik's artwork. It's yeah. not overdone. There's echoes mm-hmm. of classic Carmine to you know when you when you see Barry in action, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. it was it was good. It was good. It's not not my favourite Barry and Jay story by any stretch, but I think it's better than some of them. Yeah. And you're you're so right. They shouldn't have spoiled a thinker on the splash page. That would have been much much better. Yeah. Oh well. Not to worry. Shall we move on to what the readers at the time thought? I think that's a wonderful idea. Let's jump ahead to Flashgrams from issue 232. So because it's a 100-pager that uh, the letters are about, there's a lot of chat about the other stories as well, but we'll concentrate just on this story, obviously. Yeah, two pages of letters in this issue because they've got the room. So the first letter we're going to read goes like this. Dear Mr Schwartz, In Flash 179, Carrie Bates wrote The Flash, Fact or Fiction, which topped everything anybody had ever written about The Flash before. In 212, he topped it with The Flash in Cartoonland. That's a great story as well. And in 229, he did it again. Look over your collections, Flash fans. Do you see any other Scarlet Speedster story that has a plot as brilliant as The Rag Doll Runs Wild? Of course you don't. Carrie starts off with some good old Flashy super strunts and the capture of some unsuper villains. Then he teams up the Flashies and brings Rag Doll back from the 40s. Barry Flash tricks the thinker into revealing himself, and the real culprit is captured. Brilliant! May Flash become eight times yearly again and may carry top this issue by 240. And that's from Michael Raship, Great Neck, New York. Great Neck! Why, thanks. I've been using some moisturiser. Mm. <laughs> if we have any listeners in New York, I need you to go to a sign that welcomes you to Great Neck and take a photograph of yourself standing next to it, pointing at your own neck. Please, mm. that would be very funny. Editorial response reads, Your wish is our command, Michael. The Flash returns to an eight times a year schedule beginning with our next issue. And you can bet that Carrie will be trying to better himself with every issue. Who's BR? Who could that be that's replying? Bob Rosakis. Bob Rosakis, of course, of course. The next letter is from regular correspondent Scott Gibson. He's basically talking about the letter column for the first little while, which you don't really need to go into, but he continues... The letter call wasn't the only reason I wrote. The story in 229 was just as good. I usually regard the Flash team-up stories with a wary eye. They usually lack a plot since the writer seems to feel he must concentrate in lots of super speed stunts for the pair of speedsters. 
Fortunately, Carrie Bates didn't worry about that angle. Rather, he made the ragdoll runs wild a real plot twister, and it worked. The reader is so busy following the wild adventure he doesn't even notice whether the two flashes perform a lot of neat super fast tricks. Truly, I've never seen a better double flash story. One final request, how about some new costumed villains? All the members of the Rogue Gallery are great, but they've been used again and again. Why haven't there been any imaginative newcomers to plague the Flash? Now, as I say, that's from Scott Gibson, Evergreen, Colorado. The response to this is... Well, Scott, last issue, we introduced The Dudes. I love that story <laughs> as well. Are you aware of that one? From 231, not off the uh-huh. top of my head. I would have to, I probably still got it, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Okay, Barry basically creates a costumed identity for himself as this dapper chap called The Dudes who can defeat the Flash, so, so he can infiltrate the rogues yes. at the rogues convention, because the rogues obviously yeah. have a convention. It's wonderful. Anyway, sorry. Yes, yes. I remember the cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this time around, Flash faced the 12-hour man, so you can't say there are no new villains these days. 12-hour man, I wonder if that's the Earth-1 equivalent of our man. The 12-hour man, good grief. 12-hour mm. men teaming up, etc. It <laughs> itself. So the next letter. Dear editor, Flash 229 was a nothing. You have really outdone yourselves this time. I read the first story because I was hopeful, but I skimmed the rest as I wasn't ready to fall asleep. Is it any wonder with such issues that when I mention that I like Flash, people look at me as if I have some strange disease? Flash seems to be going downhill at super speeds. Loyal fans can't do that much. It's up to the publishing end to produce the stories that will enrapture Flash fans old and new. As to Green Lantern fighting powerful villains and getting into hair-raising predicaments, here, here, same for the Flash. One idea would be to get the Scarlet Speedster in a situation you can't get him out of. And at the end of the issue, at that psychological moment, conveniently forgetting to publish the second part. <laughs> and that scathing review was from Carla Jarrett from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Wow, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? I like, I mean, obviously there's definitely going to be a point in, a, in about, what, 40 issues time when <laughs> Barry's putting a terrible psychological moment at the end of an issue. Yeah, but they do publish an issue after it. <laughs> yes. That, well, that's someone that really didn't like Flash 229, so let's see what the next correspondent says. Dear Editor, Well, we see that our old friend Jay Garrick is slipping. The idea of having two Flashes together was a neat gimmick when it was first introduced, but now it is becoming overused. Lines like, Eek! A peeping Flash! And thoughts like that are occupational hazards to us super speedsters didn't help the story either. The next paragraph is basically some more stuff about Green Lantern. We don't really need to know that because it's not relevant to what we're covering. That letter being from T.E. Pouncey, Douglas, Kansas. The next letter. Dear Editor, One reason The Flash has become my favourite comic is your knack for treating the characters like believable individuals, not just stereotyped goodies and baddies. The return of Jay Garrick was enough to guarantee my enjoyment of The Ragdoll Runs Wild in 229, but it was the little human touches that really made the story. The banter between Barry and Iris... Joan's wifely concern, Pete ragdoll Merkel's nervousness without his mask, not to mention Jay's discouragement and desire to confide in his pal Barry. The only real disappointment was Barry's revelation that he hadn't truly been stunned by the thinker's electric bolt. This turned Jay's act of heroism into Barry's act of kindness. Why couldn't you have allowed the older Flash to really save his friend after the less experienced speedster has gotten himself into trouble? And that's from Janie Allen from Weymouth, Massachusetts. The next letter is chiefly concerned with Green Lantern, so we don't need to read it, but it's worth pointing out it's from Tom Beerbum, who worked on the Legion of Superheroes for a while in the 90s, and whose autograph I got on a couple of Legion comics at Glasscock in 1994. Wow! So that's quite exciting. That's quite nice to see. Superb. Tom and Mary, I was big fans of theirs. Mm -hmm. The final letter then from 232 goes like this. Dear Julie, Bob and Carrie, Flash 229, following the tradition of the last 20 issues, was rotten. It wasn't horrible, just rotten. Every issue we are faced with another inept costumed crook who is caught in a scarlet speedster's backwash and taken in. Mr Bates is getting too repetitive. I think Flash is due for a complete overhaul. Give the Allens a child. Make Barry more personable. Let the Flash fight real honest-to-badness villains. Or at least give the baddies some character. The way these rogues gallery guys act, it could all be the same man. Carrie Bates can do it. Look at Terra Man and Superman. Now there's a villain. And that letter's from Perry Wilson, Sonora, California, I'm guessing. Yes. Editorial response to that one reads... The rogues gallery is voted to hold the next convention at your house, Perry. <laughs> at which time they will show you what characters they are. So says Bob Rosakis. 
Wow. That was interesting. Mm. Very little in the way of positive correspondence, really. There was there was quite a yeah. quite a mix, but it was weighted towards the negative. That was very interesting. Yep. And it's always a joy to see letters from future pros. It's one of the things I love best about covering these letters pages. Absolutely. I wish I'd I wish I'd known when I met Tom thirty years ago. <gasps> the Glasgow <laughs> Comic Con. That is terrifying. Yeah, what what issues of Legion did I get signed? I got the issue of Legionnaires where Matt Rita Ladd has woken up and been turned into a girl, and I got the issue of the five years later Legion, which has all of the the SW6 batch kids all standing, sort of looking up into the sky. That one run about issue twenty odd, I think, after the the Quiet Darkness saga part two, whatever it was called. Mm. Run about then. It's a while, so so yeah. Well, I post them on the socials. I think you should. I think you should. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I will. Yes. Alongside Tom's letter, that would probably be quite good. And speaking of the socials, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Earth 2 Podcast and on Twitter we're at podcast underscore Earth 2. It's the number two for all our social media. And you can also write to us like these wonderful letter hacks did back in the day to the Flash comic. Except we do it electronically. You can email us at the Earth 2 Podcast at gmail.com and tell us your thoughts on this story or indeed your thoughts on the podcast in general. Yes, please do. We will be returning to the Flash in a few issues time. There'll be a few more issues in the 230s that we'll be covering. Look forward to those. Check out the socials. A couple of bits and bobs to post this week. Nothing much, but you know, now that Peter suggested it, maybe I will post my, my signed Tom Beerbaum comics. That'd be fun to pad it out a bit. Mm-hmm. As I always say, if you're feeling generous, listeners, you go to wherever it is you receive your podcasts and leave us a positive review. That'd be lovely. Or go to our coffee page and buy Peter the price of a beverage. That's always appreciated. And be sure, if you enjoy the podcast, to spread the word to tell all your comic book pals. Let them know if you're enjoying what we're doing. What is it next week? I can't remember, but it's probably one of those ones I've had to do an awful lot of reading and preparation for, so I look forward to it. I believe it is. Maybe we'll have another special guest if we can nail him down for two minutes. Maybe. Anyway, on that bombshell. On that bombshell, David and I are going to go flashing in the park. But I've been Peter. <laughs> I've been David. Take care, folks. We'll see you soon on... The Earth, Earth 2, two podcast. podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinate set for Earth Prime. Forget what I just said, Barry. Let's go. Oh, my God. (laughs) 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 Oh, hey, right, okay. Forget what I just said, Barry. Let's go flashing.